all the prophecies are speaking about the end of the world and at the end of the world the story is about among other things God's people and God's people at the end of the world are illustrated in the history of the Millerites and the history of the 144,000. So when you fe see a passage in scripture that is an illustration of the Millerites you should understand that it's also going to be an illustration of the 144,000. There'll be some variations in the type anti-type relationship but one of the most serious ones is probably Luke 21. And in Luke 21, uh, on the bottom of page 36, in Luke 21 the disciples ask Christ a question. It says, and, and, as, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, and said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? They want to know what the sign is of the end of the world. And when a question is asked in the Bible, we're supposed to understand that that question is asked for our understanding. We're supposed to ask the question, <coughs> what's the sign of the end of the world? The Desire of Ages, commenting on this, Sister White says, Christ's words had been spoken in the hearing of a large number of people. But when he was alone, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Tell us, they said, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Jesus did not answer his disciples by taking up separately the destruction of Jerusalem and the great day of his coming. He mingled the description of these two events. He had opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them. Had he opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them, they would have been unable to endure the sight. In mercy to them, he blended the description of two great crises. What two great crises? The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the destruction at the end of the world. He blended these two great crises, leaving the disciples to study out the meaning for themselves. When he referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration in that day when the Lord shall rise out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity, when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This entire discourse, discourse was, given, was given not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. So for those of us that are living in the last scenes of this earth's history, the disciples raise the question, what is the sign of the second coming of Christ? And he illustrated by using the destruction of Jerusalem as one of the types of the end of the world. Sister White, in great controversy, comments on the destruction of Jerusalem. It says, signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. In the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sunset, sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. For seven years, <coughs> a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem declaring the, the what? The seals. The seals. <coughs> the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night he chanted the wild dirge, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds. A voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaints escaped his lip. To insult and abuse he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem. Woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. There's a warning message that's proclaimed at the end of the world that's illustrated as a woe. So as Jesus begins to answer the question of the disciples in Luke 21, beginning in verse 20, he says this, <coughs> And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let them not that are in the countries enter therein too. 
For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and then to them that give suck in those days. For there, sh there shall be great distress, and in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captives into all nations. <clears throat> and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When we first had the privilege of, of sharing publicly Bible prophecy, what we have dealt with from the very beginning and more often than anything else is the last six verses of Daniel 11. The prophetic message of the hour at the end of the world is built upon the last six verses of Daniel 11 and we have said very little about the last six verses of Daniel 11 here this week. But there are certain arguments in Adventism concerning the last six verses of Daniel 11 that have come up through the years, some that have went away, but some that persist. One of the arguments is whether or not probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday Law, and that's just a, as they say, that's a no-brainer, okay? But the other, the other argument is, is that the glorious land, in verse 41 of Daniel 11, is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Whereas the truth about the glorious land is that it's the United States of America. I mean, there, there are many, many, many ways to demonstrate this from the scripture. A triple application of prophecy comes to mind. Okay? In order for pagan Rome to take control of the world, according to Daniel 8.9, it had to conquer the east, the south, and the pleasant land. That's Daniel 8.9. The correct pioneer understanding, correct understanding that Daniel 8 9, that horn is pagan Rome, and it had to conquer three geographical areas to take control of the world. Then it ruled the world supremely. How long did it rule the world supremely for? A time. Daniel 11 24 says pagan Rome would rule the world for a time. Sister Uriah Smith comments on this in Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. This isn't just my understanding. Daniel 11.24 says pagan Rome would rule the world for a time and a time is a year and a year is 360 years. But in order for pagan Rome to rule the world supremely it had to first overcome three geographical obstacles. The east, the south, the pleasant land. The east was Syria. The pleasant land was Israel. And Egypt was the third obstacle and it was conquered at, by pagan Rome at the Battle of Actium in 31 B.C. And for 360 years it was invincible until the year 330 when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople and then the pag pagan Rome began to disintegrate. Daniel 11.24 said it would rule the world for a time and it did. But before it could rule supremely it had to overcome three geographical er areas. A triple application of prophecy, the characteristics of pagan Rome combined with the characteristics of papal Rome will identify the characteristics of modern Rome. In order for the papacy to rule the world supremely, it first had to do what? Remove three horns, the Hiroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, three geographical areas. The third of those was removed in 538. The Goths were driven from the city of Rome, and then papal Rome ruled the world supremely for 1260 years. The testimony of two things is established. In order for pagan Rome to rule the world supremely and papal Rome to rule the world supremely, they first have to overcome three geographical areas. Those two witnesses tell you about modern Rome. In order for modern Rome's deadly wound to be healed, in order for modern Rome to wor rule the world supremely, based upon Bible prophecy and historical fact, it first has to overcome three geographical obstacles. Those three geographical obstacles are Daniel 1140, the king of the south. Daniel 1141, the glorious land. Daniel 1142, Egypt. They have to be geographical areas. Based upon pagan Roman papal Rome, they, they have to be geographical areas. The King of the South was the Soviet Union, which was brought down in 1989, thus telling Seventh-day Adventists that the work of papacy returning to the throne of the earth was underway. And you better prepare for the next verse, because when the papacy conquers the glorious land in verse 41, the word glorious there means in sense of prominence. When it conquers the glorious land, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it's conquering the most prominent land in the world. What's, what's the most prominent land in the world? Okay, now those people in Adventism that say it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church, well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not the most glorious church in the world, let alone being a land. It's not a geographical area. There's, a, there's many ways to show this, all right? It's, but that controversy has raged. I mean, it's raged. I mean, you may not realize it, but from the top of Adventism to almost all, almost all the self-supporting ministries in Adventism are in opposition to what we're sharing. 
Okay, if you didn't know it, know it. All right. And one of the points of battle is the glorious land. Is the glorious land the United States of America? And it is, by the way, verse 42 is Egypt. It represents all the countries of the world. And that's just what Sister White says. First, the United States passes the Sunday law. Then every country on the globe follows her example. But in 2004, a friend of mine that's sitting in the room was reading some articles by Hiram Edson. And he sees that Hiram Benson has developed a very, and, and we handed those articles out here this week. So it's the biggest, the thickest handout we, we handed out to you. It's in there, you can read it. Hiram R. Edison shows from the Bible and the Bible alone that after 1798, after the papacy's deadly wound is healed, that the Lord, based on Bible prophecy, is going to raise up modern Israel in the United States of America. And that's, that's what he's doing. He's showing that from scriptures. And he gets to the point in one part where he says, the glorious land of Daniel 11 verse 41 is the United States of America. So as soon as Brother Duane read that, he gets on the phone. He says, hey, you know what? There's a pioneer that agrees that the glorious land is the United States. And this is big stuff. You're in the, at that time, this is 2004. That was still a real hot topic. You know, there's, there's one brother travels in this area on a regular basis, but he travels all over the world. And when it comes to the glorious land, he says, what Pippinger teaches about the glorious land is a Jesuit teaching. Hmm, I mean, that's how serious it gets. You know, you get called a lot of things, but you're at, a, you're at another level when they're calling you a Jesuit, all right? <laughs> and his logic is flawed, but that's okay. But I just didn't know that's the, that's the environment. That's why the phone call comes, hey, one of the pioneers believes the glorious lands of the United States too. So we start reading these articles. And the title of these articles is The Times of the Gentiles. And this is where Hiram Edson makes his argument that Miller was wrong, that you should apply the 2520 against the northern kingdom instead of the southern kingdom. And at that point, he, they were seeing both, but they didn't know you needed to look at both of them the, together. Not, you don't pick one prophecy, you have to pick them both. So we got drawn into that study at that time period. And when I read it, I liked it. I, I, I immediately, uh, the first few times I shared the 2520, it was kind of at the end of meetings, and I was doing it so, sort of like a novelty, because I didn't know the 2520, but I was just so fa infatuated with it that I went ahead and shared it. I, I wasn't sure what it meant, but I couldn't get away from it. And later we started seeing what it really meant. But I knew Hiram Edson was wrong. Okay. Because, because he, he says that the time of the end, the time of the Gentiles ends in 1798. And 10 years before that, I had already figured out that the time of the Gentiles ended in 1844. Okay. Now most people in Adventism, if they've taken a position on when the time of the Gentile ends, they say it's in 1967 at the Three Day War. I think it's 67. When the Jews took back Jerusalem. Okay, that's a, that's a Protestant teaching. It's not an Adventist teaching because we know that Jerusalem at the end of the world is spiritual Jerusalem. It's not literal Jerusalem. But nevertheless, it has come into Adventism and very few people have taken a position one way or another about what Jesus meant about the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled here in Luke 21. But I knew for a certainty that the times of the Gentile entered in 1844. So as much as I liked Hiram Edson's articles, when he said the times of the Gentiles entered in 1798, I knew he was wrong. So, you can see on the top of page 38, Jesus said that Jerusalem shall be trodden down, until the gen down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then you have a quote from Sister White, there are others, where she says the city of Jerusalem is no longer a sacred place. Jerusalem in Bible prophecy at the end of the world is not the literal city of Jerusalem. You do not need Sister White to demonstrate this, but makes it easy for us. Jerusalem at the end of the world is spiritual Jerusalem. Okay. So you'll see um, well, I'm going to show you Hiram Edson's logic. Okay. Um, uh, under 1798. I, have a, I should have put 1798 before 1844. I'll show you Hiram Edson's first. Hiram Ed, Edson's reason for saying that the, the times of the Gentiles ended in 1798 is because he understood that this 2520 time prophecy is describing, describing when Jerusalem would be trampled down. And you see under 1798 
on your notes, Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2, and it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under to, f- underfoot forty and two months. What's that time period? What's that forty-two months? Okay, so, so Hiram Edson saying, Jerusalem the, is the holy city, and that it's treading underfoot, and that's what Jesus said, that Jerusalem shall be trodden down unto, of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. And Hiram Edson goes to Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, where it says that the holy city will be trodden down from 538 to 1798. And Hiram Edson says, 1798 must be the times of the Gentiles. The conclusion of it. But he's wrong. Okay. The reason, the reason he's wrong, in my mind, this is my mind, is because of Daniel 8.13, which, which says 18.44. Notice what Daniel 8.13 says above where we just read. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto a certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Where's the sanctuary? No, but no, no, no. Yeah, but in the topic here, where's the sanctuary? It's in Jerusalem, is it not? Okay. So this is about this Jerusalem being trodden underfoot as well, right? And the question here in verse 13 is how long does this take place? And what's the answer in verse 14? Under 2300 years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So now I knew the times of the Gentiles ended in 1844 for a variety of reasons. So I had uh, I had a personal struggle with this for a while, at least until, you, until it just, the lights clicked on. If you go back to the top of the page, Jesus says, Jerusalem should be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Plural. And Jerusalem was trodden down with the two twenty-five twenty time prophecies. And one ended in 1798, and that's what Hiram Medicine was dealing with. And one ended in 1844, and that's what William Miller was dealing with. It's the times of the Gentiles. The trading down of Jerusalem prophetically that was covering both of these time prophecies. So when you get to this verse in Luke 21, Jesus is answering the question, what are the signs of the end of the world? And Jesus brings the disciples' mind right down there to the 1798 to 1844 time period. Where does he bring their mind down to? to the Millerite history from 1798 to 1844. This is the history where the times of the Gentiles comes to a conclusion. All right, That's where we're at in verse 24. Then in verse 25 through 28, Jesus begins to tell the signs that will confront this history. All right, He leads them to this history by speaking of the trampling down of Jerusalem. And then he says, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And upon earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart filling them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. What are the signs in the sun of the moon? 1780 back here that just precede the Millerite history. You have a quote from Great Controversy there. When's the sign of the stars? 1833. This, the falling of the stars here. What happened in 1833 beyond the falling of the stars? In 1833, Two years after Miller began to present in public the evidence of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior as a token of the second advent. In this same year, William Miller receives his credential to preach. He's been preaching, but it wasn't until 1833 that he receives credentials. I'm not too concerned about credentials but personally, but this is when the message here receives power. Okay, William Miller begins to speak, he receives his credentials, and suddenly the manifestation of the falling of the stars takes place, and the people in the world that realize the falling of the stars, the Holy Spirit is convicting them 
that this is the sign that has been mentioned in the Bible that precedes the second coming of Christ. So the Lord is confirming M M Miller's work through external signs. Most people in Adventism understand these things, but the part they don't understand is the distress of nations. In 1838 to 1840, what's the distress of nations? from Uriah Smith under distress of nations it says in 1838 Turkey became involved in a war with Egypt the Egyptians bid fair to overthrow the Turkish power to prevent this the four great powers of Europe England Russia Austria and Prussia interfered to sustain the Turkey government the distress of nations that is ended on August 11th, 1840, but leads up to August 11th, 1840, is a sign that Jesus identifies as a sign of the end of the world in Luke 21. It's the distress that was being brought about by Islam. Sister White comments on the shaking of the angry nations in early writings page 41 she says I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken and that the events come in order war and rumors of war sword famine and pestilence are the first to shake the powers of earth then the voice of God will shake the sun the moon stars and this earth also I saw that the shaking of the powers in Europe is not as some teach the shaking of the powers of heaven but it is the shaking of the angry nations Okay, the distress that was taking place in Europe with Islam is the shaking of the angry nations and this is part of Christ's answer to the disciples question concerning what would be the signs of the second coming of Christ after he sets this this foundation up then Christ is going to tell them a parable bottom of the page it says and he spake to them a parable <clears throat> behold the fig tree and all the trees when they now shoot forth you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand so likewise when you see these things come to pass know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away <clears throat> So now, now Jesus is, is repeating and enlarging upon his comments before he introduces the parable. And in the parable, he's going to repeat and enlarge. And he says, Behold the, the fig tree and all the trees. And in several places, Sister White comments on the trees. But here she says, Mark the cursing of the fig tree representing the Jewish nation covered with leaves of profession, but no fruit to be found thereon. The curse is pronounced upon the fig tree which represents the moral thinking living agent cursed of God living as it were as were the Jews for 40 years after this event yet dead. Mark the other trees representing the Gentiles were not covered. They were leafless making no pretension to having a knowledge of God. Their time of fruit leaving was not yet. The trees and their leaves are symbols of men and the profession that they make. So when Jesus says behold the fig tree and all the trees he wants us to behold them at the point where they are budding out okay that's a sign he's telling us about the sign at the end of the world and the leaves when the leaves bud out they represent profession right so he says that when you see this happen you know that summer is nigh at hand and when is the summer Jeremiah 8.20 says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So the summer is the harvest. But when is the harvest? Matthew 13.39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the world. So this parable about the trees, Jesus is being more specific to the end of the world than he is the Millerite history. Because he says when you see this going on, it's summertime and summertime is the harvest and the harvest is the end of the world. And what's he, what's he explaining to us? He's answering what the sign? What sign is it for God's people at the end of the world? Who, who's God's people at the end of the world? What's the sign for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world that the return of Christ is about to take place? According to this it says when 
Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. The, our sign is when the fig trees bud. Right? Notice what Sister Wright says in Great Controversy 308. Christ had bidden his people to watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. When these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh, nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So what is it that causes the trees to bud out in the springtime in the Middle East? It's the latter rain. It's the latter rain. Notice Joel 2.23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. When's the first month? In our day, in our, I don't know the, the Hebrew months, but when's the first month of the, of the biblical calendar? Because Joel isn't talking about our calendar. He's talking about the biblical calendar. What's the first month for? End of March, April. It varies a little bit. And what do we call March and April? The springtime. So the latter rain comes in the springtime. Causes the trees to bud out, right? Okay. Now in, in verse 31, 32, it says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. What generation? The ones that see this sign. The generation that sees this sign lives until all these things be fulfilled. The generation that sees what sign? That sees the trees bite out. The generation that sees the latter rain. Because that's what causes the trees to bed out, right? So what is our sign? Our sign is the latter rain. Budding of the trees. That's fine. But the, what causes the trees to bud, the only reason you and I can see that the trees are budding is because the latter rain has arrived. Notice next verse, top of page 41. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The, the generation that sees the latter rain lives till Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. Did the Millerites see Christ come in the clouds of heaven? Yes, they did. Didn't they? We dealt with this earlier this week. Yes. <clears throat> Daniel 7.13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the what? The clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. When, does, when was this fulfilled? Sister White says in the Great Controversy, And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion, dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. The coming of Christ here described is not his second coming to the earth. He comes to the Ancient of Days in heaven to receive a dominion and glory and kingdom, which will be given him at the close of his work as a mediator. It is this coming and not his second advent to earth that was foretold in the prophecy to take place at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844 attended by holy angels on October 22nd, 1844. Christ came in the clouds. And therefore what Jesus is saying in Matthew 21 is that the Millerites had signs for them. What were their signs? The signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, the distress of nations, the sun and the moon and the stars and Islam. And the Millerites that saw these signs, did they live until Christ, this generation does not pass, did they live until Christ came in the clouds? Yes. Is the mil <laughs> you don't have to, they don't have to know it. They don't have to know us for, under, for us to understand the type. This is a type. By faith. <laughs> sister, that's what Sister White was there and that she's saying that he did that very thing. So she knew. But, the, 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 but anyway, what do we know about this history? It's going to be repeated to the very letter in this history. 
Okay, so, so in this history, there will be a sign for this generation here. And when that sign arrives, then you know, not in a metaphorical or general or casual sense, but you know from God's prophetic word which never fails that you are living in the final generation. Period. This generation does not pass till Christ comes in the clouds. And what's our sign? Our sign is the budding trees of spring latter rain. Notice under the same event, we've read this before, this is where Sister White, I'll just tell you, it says that Daniel 14, Daniel 7, 13, and Malachi and Matthew 25 are the same event. They were fulfilled on October 22nd, 1844. Bottom of page 42. We'll go back to that bottom of page 42. Go to the next page, page 43. And you'll see a, a subtitle that says, We must recognize the manifestation of the power of God. Alright? We read this earlier. It says, Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues. We shall not recognize... We shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. What's it mean to recognize? Notice the definition of recognize. To recollect or recover the knowledge of, either with an avowal of that knowledge or not. We recognize a person at a distance when we recollect that we have seen him before or that we have formerly known him. We recognize his features or his voice. Recognize doesn't mean to see. It means to see something that you've recognized before. If someone's walking in the distance that you've never met before, it's just a person in the distance. But if it's your husband or your wife or your child, usually from a distance you can recognize them. And Sister White says, unless we're receiving the former rain, unless we're daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Here we are living in the time of the latter rain. The last time the Holy Spirit was poured out was when? Ah, midnight cry. Right here. Pentecost before that. There wasn't any of us living in the summer of 1844, right? So we're not going to recognize that from our personal experience. How in the world can we recognize the latter rain? Now go back to page, the previous page, page 42. We've often pointed to this <coughs> passage in Great Controversy this week. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with its glory. What angel is this? This is the angel of Revelation 18. Right? A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. So she's talking about Revelation 18 and then notice what she says. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glad glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has ever been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. Do you see what Sister White just did? She compared the latter reign of the fourth angel of Revelation 18 to the history of what? 1840 to 1844. Right? You see that? Notice what she says. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Now she's going to compare it to Pentecost. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. Then, we, then shall we know if we follow on to the know, know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. 
Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. Now notice this next sentence. This, we have an argument here that takes place. One of the arguments against what we're teaching here is where does Brother Pippincher and these other guys get off saying that the latter rain is falling? What, what, what biblical authority do we have to be identifying that the latter rain began to fall on September 11th, 2001? Isn't that kind of fanatic? Notice the next sentence. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. She's saying the prophecies that were fulfilled at Pentecost are repeated at the end of the world. How many of you have read the book of Acts in the Bible? And what was, one of the things that goes on in the book of Acts is Peter. He, he tells the Jews, no. These men aren't drunken, these men that are preaching in different languages. These men are receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And all the prophecies that were fulfilled at that time period are fulfilled again in the latter rain. In other words, when the latter rain comes, it is demanded by God's word that men will be identifying that the latter rain is falling because that's what Peter was doing and it was a fulfillment of prophecy. And she says, the prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Now the people that oppose what we're doing, they're doing it because they're just, they're in opposition. But as Adventists we know this already. Did the Lord ever try to pour the, pour the Holy Spirit out upon this church? He did. How did he do it? Jodes and Wagner. Was it identified in that time period that this was the outpouring of the Spirit? Sister White was very clear. So this isn't the fact that someone's here at the end of the world saying, the latter rain is now sprinkling upon God's people. It's consistent with the sacred history of Adventism. It's consistent with what took place at Pentecost. And Pentecost is repeated in the latter rain. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Brothers and sisters, in these reform movements we've looked at, there's always signs. I mean, we know there's signs as Adventists. We, we have some common signs that we know of. What's the Sunday law? It's a sign of what? The abomination of desolation. But what's, this, what's, it, what's it tell us that we're to do? Everyone knows this one? It's time. That there's a sign. We know in Adventism that there's a sign for this generation. The Old Testament over and over again talks about the signs and wonders that were done in Egypt. What were the signs and wonders that were done in Egypt? It was the signs that took place in the reform movement of Moses as they were coming out of Egypt. In the, in the reform movement of Christ, the Jews asked Jesus for a sign, didn't they? He says, no sign will be given to this adulterous generation except Jonah, destroy this temple in three days, it will be raised up. Each of these generations have signs. And these signs are part of the test. You either accept the signs, understand the signs, or you're spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. And the sign that you and I have to recognize is the sign of the budding trees of spring. We have to recognize it. And recognize it means that it's something that we have seen before. And brothers and sisters, this is the, the history of the 144,000. This is the history where the latter rain has been poured out. Have you ever seen this history before? The Advent Movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God, similar to Pentecost. That's why in Isaiah 28, 
But Isaiah is telling us that the latter rain message is taught. The rest and the refreshing that they would not hear. It's taught by what? Bringing line upon line. The reform line of Noah, Moses, Elijah, the three decrees, Christ, the Millerites, are reform movements. They're lines that are illustrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of the world and we are required to recognize we have to recognize when the latter rain begins to sprinkle it's life or death notice this next quote on the bottom of page 43 and of course this is the sign brothers and sisters this is the sign that Adventism will refuse to see there will be some that will see. But this sign, this is where the, sh the shaking really takes hold. Unless though, and we'll put, look, I, I always like that this is one of the places where they blocked out a city or a state or a town or a church. Because it allows me to say, okay, this Sabbath we're going to stick in this blank spot, Loma Linda. Unless those who can help in Loma Linda are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of the Lord when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. Sounds like it's important to recognize it. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God to dictate even what movement shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the word world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is make, taking the reins into his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work in righteousness. Pardon me? Of righteousness. Next page. We must not wait for the latter rain. It is coming upon all who will recognize and appropriate the dews and showers of grace that fall upon us. How do we recognize it? We recognize that it has been illustrated in the history of the Millerites, in the history of Christ. Was there an outpouring of the Spirit in the history of Christ? Was there an outpouring of the Spirit in the history of the Millerites? Is there an outpouring history in our generation? Was the temple twice cleansed in the time of Christ? Was it twice cleansed in the Millerite history? It was going to be twice cleansed here at the end of the world. What cleanses the temple? Divinity flashing through humanity. When did the divinity confront the Millerites? The first manifestation. 1840. Mighty angel comes down out of heaven. A testing process that begins. The temple is being cleansed until the Protestants close their doors. Midnight cry. Manifestation of divinity and humanity. Confronts the Millerites until Christ closed the door. Temple cleansed twice. This is an illustration of the latter rain. Brothers and sisters, think about it. Think about it. This is, this is what blows my mind. Number one, number one, I left out, I left se out several arguments about the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. And I'm some, of you, uh, some of you I know are familiar with what we teach on these things. And you know that there's several arguments that we haven't dealt with here this week. We just haven't had time. But we've put enough out there for this audience or for people that are looking at these recordings. Ow. There's just too much evidence. The mighty angel came down in Revelation 10. That's easy to see. It's prefiguring when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, right? It's easy to see. This is a fulfillment of the parable of ten virgins. 
This is a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. This is a repeat of the th this is a repeat of the three angels' messages that came into history here. It's a repetition. We're told over and over again. Islam was restrained right here. Who restrained Islam in that history? Four great European powers. What does the number four represent in Bible prophecy? World. The whole world. East, now, south, north, and west, right? Here, the whole world puts a restraint upon Islam. Okay, this restraint is in fulfillment of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. This restraint. Fulfillment in the seventh trumpet, the third woe. This confirms the principle of the year day principle for the Millerites. This conf confirms the principle that is the foundational principle for this history, that being that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. There is just too many lines of prophetic arguments to not see that there is, th this isn't a delusion. I am certain that what I teach has errors in it. I'm certain I'm a human being. I don't see everything. I, I know mistakes I've made in the past that I've had to correct. And I'm certain there's some mistakes I'm holding on to that I don't recognize right now. I'm just a human being. But there is too much evidence on this to not get the point that only the Lord could put this argument together. Only the Lion of the tribe of Judah could open this logic to our minds. And this isn't a minor, minor prophetic study, brothers and sisters. This is identifying that this history, which is a history of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as being repeated, and you and I are required to recognize this because this is our sign. And what marks the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is when the great buildings of New York City are brought down. And the generation that sees that event does not pass until Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. Based upon the word of God. Do you, we, we realize the Seventh-day Adventists that for 165 years that, that we've always had speakers saying, we're the generation that's going to be alive when Jesus returns, right? But Luke 21, it's making that argument absolutely crystal clear. This sign, when it comes, we're the last generation. We do not pass. What's the next quote? Now, brethren, God wants us to take our position under how are we going to know. Now, brethren, God wants us to take our position with the man that carries the lantern. We want to take our position where the light is and where God has given the trumpet a certain sound. We want to give the trumpet a certain sound. What's the trumpet message at the end of the world? Brothers and sisters, you know that in Adventism, when the biblical research department says we no longer accept the pioneer teaching on the trumpets, what they do is they place the trumpet message at the end of the world. Okay, now there's two ways to do that. They're, they're both wrong. They're both wrong. All right. One is to say the pioneers were wrong. Okay, the correct understanding is at the end of the world and then you'll see a bunch of foolishness. All right. The other way is to say the pioneers were correct, but this is a secondary application. But brothers and sisters, there can't be no secondary application. There are secondary applications. We've shown them. This line here of the Millerites, this is the line of Noah. This is the line of Moses, Elijah, the three decrees, the Millerites, and the 144,000. There are secondary applications of Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar in the word of God. But when it comes to the trumpets and the seals and the churches, can't be no secondary application. Why? Because they haven't finished. We're living in the seventh church in the time of this opening of the seventh seal in the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And but they have to finish before they can be repeated. 
So when Sister White says, we want to give the trumpet a certain sound, what trumpet message do we want to give at the end of the world? Our message is the seventh trumpet. And what's the seventh trumpet? It's the third woe. And what's the third woe? It's the role of Islam in marking when the latter rain begins and the refreshing arrives. We have been in perplexity and we've been in doubt and churches are ready to die. But now here we read, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Well now, how are we going to know anything about that message if we're not in a position to recognize anything of the light of heaven when it comes to us? How do we recognize when the light of heaven comes to us in the latter rain? It has to be something that we have seen before. And we see it in these histories, brothers and sisters, line upon line. And we will just as soon pick up the darkest deception when it comes to us from somebody that agrees with us when we have not a particle of evidence that the Spirit of God has sent them. Christ said, I come in the name of my Father, but you will not receive me. Now that is just the work that's been going on here ever since the meeting at Minneapolis. Because God sends a message in his name that does not agree with your ideas, therefore you conclude it cannot be a message of God. And that's the attitude of most Adventism when you tell them that September 11, 2001 is a fulfillment of prophecy and that it marks the arrival of Islam in end time Bible prophecy. They just don't want to hear about that, do they? Anyone try to share that with your Adventist brothers and sisters? I have. Next quote. Any question that Satan can arouse in the mind to create doubt in regard to the grand history of the past troubles of the people of God will please his satanic majesty and is an offense to God. The tidings of the Lord soon coming in power and great glory to our world is truth and in 1840 many voices were raised in its proclamation. In the place of those who have not been brought over the ground, who have not had an individual experience when it was a positive necessity to know the truth as it was unfolding before them, in the place of these, tearing to pieces the building which God has erected on the interpretation of the prophets, let them in all meekness fall into line and work in harmony with those whose voices are now silent in death. Work in harmony with the pioneer testimony in agreement with the foundational truths represented on this chart. And with workers who are still living, fall into line, obey the orders of the captain of, the, of your salvation, and bear witness of the light which the Lord has flashed upon the world and the messages for these last days. Keep in step with your leader. The dealings of God's, God with his people should oft, be often retreated, repeated. He has worked as a wonder-working God. He has baptized his chosen messengers with the Holy Spirit. The past history of the cause of God needs often to be brought before the people young and old, that they might be familiar with it. How frequently were the waymarks set up by the Lord in his dealings with ancient Israel, lest they should forget the history of the past. Christ, their invi invi invisible leader, commanded Moses to form these events into song that the people of Israel might teach them to their children. Let me finish. It, it is the device of Satan to divert the mind from these things and keep it employed with an unprofitable conversation that the Lord's truth and manifest power in dealing with his people should be regarded as a thing of the past and dropped out of their remembrance. But we are exhorted to call to mind the former days. After you were illuminated, you endured a great, great fight of afflictions. I was reading this. I, was about that. I totally, my mind went somewhere else. She's saying that we're supposed to stand on the foundations, right? And that anything that Satan can bring in to divert our mind from understanding this history is pleasing to his satanic majesty. And then she talked about, she talked about the fact that um, the, the Jews were, recorded, were required to put their past history to song. And we went up to Idaho about five or six weeks ago and there's a sister that's into this message and she's written a song about the seven thunders and she's a musician. You know, she can play about, I don't know how many instruments, many, many instruments, so, and she can write music. 
So they played this song. And she's got a song about the seven thunders and about this history and about the repetition of this history that is just a really nice song. <laughs> it's a really good song. And I have a copy of the sheet music at home, but I had forgot about it till I was reading that. So that brings us to this point here. <coughs> If the truth for this time, what's the truth for this time? That the trees are budding out. That the latter rain is sprinkling upon God's people. That the dirt brush man is sweeping the rubbish and counterfeit coins out the window and taking his people back to the old path. If this truth, if the truth for this time if the signs that are thickening on every hand, what are the signs? Earthquakes. Have you heard of any earthquakes in the recent past? How about pestilences? How about distress of nations brought on by Islam? Islam is the distress of nations. How about economic problems? How about wars and rumors of wars? Is there a rumor of war about maybe Israel going into Iran here in the next couple months? Okay. Pardon me? If the truth for this time, if the signs that are thickening on every hand that testify that the end of all things is at, is at hand are not sufficient to arouse the sleeping energy of those who profess to know the truth, then darkness proportionate to the light which has been shining will overtake these souls. There is not a semblance of an excuse for their indifference that they will be able to present to God in the great day of final reckoning. There will be no reason to offer as why they did not live and walk and work in the light of the sacred truth of the word of God and thus reveal to a sin-darkened world through their conduct, their sympathy, and their zeal that the power and reality of the gospel could not be controverted. We as a people have been given ten times more light than the Millerites and the Millerites light shone as the sun and if we reject this truth we go into a corresponding amount of darkness we had meetings one time in uh, Bolivia and they rented a, a Baptist college to have the meetings and we were in the in the, the soccer field it was a small soccer field of the Baptist college and it was it was enclosed it had corrugated tin on the roof so we got to we got to have our meetings several days meetings the Baptist boys would stand on that side of the wall and they would take and they would throw rocks up on the corrugated roof and then you'd get to hear them go boop, boom, 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 boop, boop, boop. But there was a, just a constant, constant dribbling of rocks through that whole meeting. There's always, there's always an attempt by Satan to steal the moment. Brothers and sisters, our sign at the end of the world is that the latter rain is sprinkling upon God's people and the ceiling of the 144,000 has arrived and we're going to be held, everyone in this room now is going to be held accountable for that truth. You may not understand it yet. You may not have determined by your own study whether what we're saying is true or not. But you can't afford to walk away from it without finding it out. And if it is true, and you find some human excuse to set it aside, then darkness that's proportionate to this light is going to come upon you. Or me. never been a more serious message. This is what all the, all the warning message of sacred history are prefiguring. Is this warning message 